So we um, know that this winery is so old that in the first wine that you're going to be tasting, I don't know if you guys have the first wine, the Falangina, is a, is a white wine. So um, have you guys ever had Falangina as a grape? Um, it's um, Sharon, if you want to say Falangina is known from which region normally? Uh, Campania. Exactly. So we're, we're in the south of Campania here. And um, normally in Molice, uh, we grow Bambino, we grow a little bit of Pinot Grigio, um, not a lot of white varietals, most, mostly Montepiciano, and then some indigenous um, little red grapes there. But um, the first one you're going to be tasting is called Falangina. And if you ever see in a wine rest in a restaurant a wine list, you'll know it's uh, from Campania. So it's quite unique to have a, a Falangina that's from a different region because even though they're neighboring, because we're having such a different terroir and uh, growing altitudes, you're going to have a Falangina that tastes completely different than a Falangina from Campania. Um, I'll tell you throughout my travels in the United States and tasting people on the Falangina, it's, it's really my number one seller. It's, mm -hmm. it's wine that whomever you are, um, whether you're a five-star restaurant, whether you're a little uh, pub, whether you're a little wine boutique, everybody buys this wine. It's, uh, I've had people tell me it's a, a mix between a Pinot Grigio and a Chardonnay. Um, I've had people say crazier things about it, but it's my number one seller in the U.S. for three years. It's, my favorite summer white, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I'm obsessed with it. I drink it all year long, but that's me. You know, I you know I always have to uh, have my little vino bianco with my aperitivo. But it's mineral, it's elegant, and you've got some vanilla undertone, some kind of I don't know if you know the word brioche which is like that French buttery um, almondy uh, cake that us French people are obsessed with. So you get all those unexpected undertone and it's got, my number one thing that I love about it, it's got such a low acidity. And um, I'll tell you, I meet a lot of guys. I mean, you guys seem to be obviously connoisseurs and you're guys that want to know about wine. So here you are tasting unique wines with us. But I see a lot of uh, guys are like, oh, I don't drink white wine, I only drink red. And I will literally force them to at least take a sip of this one. And then I get a smile like, oh, you're right. Wow, that was unexpected. That's so good. Oh, my God. Um, so it really is that all oh, that crowd pleaser. Um, it's a great wine to introduce your friend to because it's definitely something, a profile that they've probably never had. And on top of it, it's from a region they've for sure never had. So it's always um, kind of a cool little um, wine to have and, and and I'm so excited when I have uh, people like Jamie presenting it at such a uh, 1099 pricing. Um, these are all hand harvested uh, wines. Um, these are wines that, as I said, our vineyards were surrounded by sheep roaming around and actually um, Antonio Valerio, the owner and the winemaker, his next wine is called La Lena, which is the wool coming from sheep. Uh, that's how, um, as raw and organic, uh, these wines come from. I'll tell you, this is a wine that you can drink, you will not have a headache the next day. Um, they barely add any sugar, they're barely, um, the, the yeast are natural, um, they're not commercial yeast that they're using here. Um, and in order to reflect uh, the region, in order to put this wine on the map, not only in Italian restaurants, but in the world, um, Antonio Valerio decided that for the Falangina and the Calirio wine, he was going to use one of the, on his label, one of the oldest artifacts uh, from in Italy. So uh, if you can see my screen share here, and if you have the wine bottle, the label for the Falangina and the Calirio, um, they're actually 1099 both wine price because they are, I call them, their husband and wife. Um, so I'll tell you about it. This is called um, the um, Eroticus Calidius. So this is a tombstone that was found in the Isernia region uh, by Antonio Valerio's vineyard. And um, this is known to be the oldest artifact uh, from the Roman Empire. It showcases the life 
of a tavern dating back from the Roman Empire. And you can see here on the tombstone, um, you can see a Calidius Eroticus. So he's talking about Calidius, the owner of the tavern, and then Fania, who is his wife. And you can see a merchant with his horse paying the owner of the tavern. So if you uh, look, go back in time, we are um, neighboring the Adriatic Sea, which is looking into the east and then going into the Mediterranean. So it was a very heavy trade route. And so you had a lot of merchants going from east to west. And uh, so this tombstone was made for Calidius and Fania that were husband and wife and owned the tavern while they were still alive. So they made that for themselves while they were still alive. And um, in this tombstone that's called the Calidius Eroticus, uh, Calidius was the owner of the tavern, and I wish I could, when I'm in doing dinners and restaurants, I have people wave, and if they win the, if they get me the right answer, they get a bottle of wine on me. Uh, but as you can imagine, the, the merchant is paying Calidius, obviously, for his lodging, for his food, um, but he's actually also paying him for his um, horse. So that's word for word what the tombstone uh, makes reference of. And so basically, Calidius, the owner of this tavern, uh, was known uh, for having the best tavern, for having the best woman in the area. And so this tombstone here is very important to Antonio Valerio and, and the family because it was found in their uh, estates. And uh, it is so unique that this tombstone here um, is actually at the Museum of the Louvre in Paris. It is unfortunately, I went to the Museum of the Louvre last year to try to see it live, but um, they're not allowing people to see it in, in order to preserve it. Uh, that's how old it is. And Antonio Valerio just got the approval uh, three months ago to have an exhibition in Molice, in Isernia of this tombstone. So the Museum of the Louvre uh, has agreed to let them borrow this tombstone to be showcased in its, where it was found originally uh, in Isernia. So that's the la that's the, uh, the, the 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 rawness that we're dealing with here, and the smallness of of these estates and the historical um, uh, compass in which we found ourselves. So we're using this for the Falangina, and I love I'd love to ask you guys what you think about the Falangina so far. Uh, if that's something that's unique, or feel free to ask a question to Jamie, or let me know what you think, or because I don't have access to the chat, unfortunately. Yeah, so um, so um, we have uh, one coming in. Um, uh, definitely noticing a, a fruity quality to the wine. Um, I'm also picking up some more maybe tropical fruits, maybe some more pineapple, maybe a touch of melon. Um, and uh, there's uh, some kind of comparison to, to Chardonnay as well. Um, right, unexpectedly. You, yeah, yeah. Um, would you say that, um, and I know the, the wine's at 13% alcohol, um, you know, which is uh, sometimes a touch high for some white wines. Is that generally pretty typical of Falangina? I, you know, I can't speak for Falangina uh, in general. I can tell you that um, the uh, Opalia is going to be 14%, but that's expected perhaps a little bit on red. But when we are in the South, we tend to have higher alcohol content naturally because um, the maceration of the fruit, the fruit is, you know, it's different. So in the South, we tend to have a little bit more high alcohol content, but this is something that the winemaker plays with vintage after vintage. Um, of last year, I think it, the 2017 vintage was 12 and a half percent alcohol. So um, we we are tending to go vintage, and you'll see that this is these are wines that evolve. This is not your wine that vintage after vintage you're going to see is the same. Uh, they're very much. Uh, alive. I mean, uh, the 2019 vintage has just been released two weeks ago. I have yet to myself taste it, uh, but I don't know what to expect. Uh, and, and 2018 was a hot year, um, so you're going to have more alcohol just because of that. And a lot of the fruit, especially that tropical fruit, is, is because of that as well. You know, it is part of the grape, but it's also because of the, uh, the hot year. And um, and it's it's 
you know, obviously the climate change and it's, this is, that's something that's happening throughout uh, all the climate, the continental climates where we're seeing a lot more alcohol content um, in the wines, whether it's France or Italy. Um, but do you feel, do you guys are feeling the alcohol? Is that why you're, uh, you're asking perhaps, Jamie? Um, I think it was uh, generally out of curiosity. I, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely in my experience, some more uh, Southern Italian white wines tend to carry a little bit higher alcohol with the right. sort of higher sugar content within the grapes. Um, but uh, you can feel it a little bit, but to me, it's an extremely well-balanced wine. I really do pick up a lot of the uh, sort of brioche, a little breadiness kind of on the end, um, I assume from some of the yeast, the lees aging. Um, and uh, which is which is also um, very uh, common in Chardonnay as well. So I think, uh, you know, from the group, the Chardonnay comparison with regard to that brioche note is, is a very is a very good good observation. I'll tell you one of my proudest achievements for this winery was when I presented it to ABC stores in Florida, which um, they have they're, they're privately owned and they have about 120 stores all over Florida. And for them to accept the wine, it says a lot. And um, they have a lot of Falangina from Campania, and they never had Molitze. And, um, you know, it's always difficult to present in the U.S. market a dark glass white wine from a region people don't know, from a grape people don't know. And uh, it's been their number one seller for a year and a half compared to any other Falangina, the two other Falanginas that they have from Campania. And yet it's uh, $1.90 more than those other um, Falangina. So that speaks highly volume about this crowd pleaser, um, genuine little uh, white wine. It's um, a perfect picture actually to represent this conversation. This is, in a, this is the town of Isernia and Antonio Valerio's vineyard is actually in the mountains. So he has all his vineyards. And so when we go visit, we go up and up and up and up. So in the middle you have here uh, the castle of Prince Pignatelli that recently passed away and Antonio Valerio is trying to really revitalize the region and attract tourism. Um, he's trying to buy this castle and kind of renovate it and have it uh, so people can come and stay and visit the vineyards. And cool little story, um, the um, church here in the center, in the right, is um, older than the castle, this little chapel. But this tower here is recent. So when the, after the castle was built, they added a little tower in the castle from Prince Pignatelli and the church refused to have the, the castle higher than their um, church. So they added uh, another layer to the church in order to be higher than the castle. So that's a cool little story uh, about the town and the people of, uh, of um, Molitze. They're very, uh, the, the food is amazing, I'll tell you. Um, there uh, a lot of seafood obviously because of the Adriatic Sea on the on the west um, but a lot of cheese and um, uh, seafood and really elegant elegant food it's not you wouldn't think you're in the south uh, for all of you know there's the the north there's the south of Italy they all have their they think the north is better than the south and they think you know so there's a lot of competition amongst it but Molise is really this little town, this really region. I mean, I know Italy back and forth and it's so unique. It's people are different. You don't think you're in the South, the way they talk, the way they eat, the way they, I mean, it's just fantastic uh, to see well, the difference. I'm, I'm dying for some scallops with this Falangina. <laughs> yes, and I, and I can share pictures. I mean, I have videos of me on top of that castle and, and the wind and you can see the Adriatic Sea bringing in uh, making, you know, this vine so special. And, and uh, we're, Antonio Valerio only has about 36 acres. Um, he desperately is trying to buy more. It's not easy, but he's trying to buy more and more and more. The average age uh, for his reds um, of the vines is about 40 to 80 years old. So um, we're, we're using very old vine on average, which is much higher than the average uh, Italian uh, wines that are used 